Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Michael DeWild. A couple reasons I wanted Marvin Gaye to introduce me. Um, one, it's Marvin Gaye. Why not? I mean, you know, if, if you can get him, right? Uh, second, um, race, racial unrest, Vietnam War, uh, environmental issues serve as a kind of backdrop or background for some of the things I'm going to be talking about in the first part of, of my talk. And then second, the title of the song, if you're familiar with classic Motown, What's Going On? It's a question that um, is behind a lot of the questions that I'm interested in. The kinds of questions like, um, why do you end up really caring about the things you care about? How do you make sense, finally, of your life? Uh, just how formative are the formative experiences that you have? And when Gleaves insisted that I speak personally uh, today, I thought, well, why not tackle out loud? I'm 55, I'm not gonna be around that much longer, so what the hell, I mean, just <laughs> might as well just say them out loud at this point. Why did I, for example, come to spend so much of my professional life dealing with issues of race, education, and through the consulting work that I do now, questions about what makes for a good workplace, a good work life? Um, can you know? C could I know? Could I figure that out? The philosophers and the theologians who educated me ask us to know ourselves and to think that some reasoned reflection, some kind of Socratic inquiry is the way to go on this, that that can lead us finally to insight, maybe even wisdom, though those folks don't, of course, always or even rarely agree on what constitutes that wisdom. Our literary tradition seems a little less certain about that, um, maybe more fond of ambiguity and paradox than logic. Goethe's response to Socrates, for example, was along the lines of know myself, know myself, Jesus, if I knew who was in here, I'm sure I'd run as far away from him as fast as I could. And now I'm under the sway of new cognitive, neurological, and psychological sciences myself. They're even less certain still about what we can know. Evolutionary biologists, for example, have shown that most complex species, especially ours, engage in self-deception on a regular basis as a way to trick other members of the species into things like food transfer, and, for example, mating. I mean, really, without a little deception, who would ever mate, right? Um, what happens, apparently, is that a part of the brain is designed to believe its own propaganda because it's simply more effective to get others to believe your tall tales if you actually believe them yourself. Courtship, business, and parenting all rely on this trait. For example, uh, my four-year-old daughter wants a cookie. The pantry is stocked with cookies. I tell her, there are no cookies. It's very helpful to get her to believe that if I actually believe that myself, at least until around 9 o'clock when she's asleep and I actually want a cookie myself. Um, what all this means for us here today is that this talk gives me a chance to share with you some of my own most cherished self-delusions, but to try to do so in a way that's so convincing that we all walk out of here believing them. So let me begin. Um, Race, relations, and reading. I'm eight years old, and Detroit is on fire. Detroit's just down the road, not at all far from where I'm playing baseball, wrestling with our dog, waiting for dinner. The National Guard goes by, then the Army. A lot of guys with guns. In Detroit, there are black people lined up in the streets, faces contorted by rage, hate, menace, maybe a kind of longing. I see that race matters. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I see that it matters. The six o'clock news says 14 killed and then 20 and then more. Blocks of the city of Detroit are destroyed. Man, what is going on? I'm nine years old and Martin Luther King Jr. is gunned down and so is Bobby Kennedy. I'm looking at a picture in Time Magazine of a South Vietnamese soldier holding in each hand the severed head of two Viet Cong. He's smiling. I can't look away from it. What's happening? I spend my summer days riding my bike, trying to keep up with my older brother and his friends. It's all sunshine and Pepsi and station wagons at the beach. Life is good, but it's tenuous too, isn't it? At night, the wars in Vietnam and Detroit are back on our black and white television set and in the magazines and newspapers that my parents describe, subscribe to. I'm a curious kid and a pretty good reader. And by the age of 10, Maybe I already know too much about body bags, the Black Panthers, lynchings, freedom riders, the Tet Offensive, domino theories, draft resistance, and LSD. And then in Life magazine, there's a picture of a young woman in a pair of bell-bottoms and nothing else. 
at a place called Woodstock, and I'm thinking, damn, I cannot believe I am missing all this. <laughs> My parents, to their everlasting credit, did not let me go to Woodstock at nine years old. It's KLW, the major radio station out of Windsor, Detroit, is my lifeline to Motown, my soundtrack for all of this as I'm, as I'm growing up. Oops, I hope that's not symbolic in any way. So. <laughs> anyway, it's all Temptations, the Supremes, little Stevie Wonder, Barry Gordy, the, founder of, the founder, of, founder of Motown, keeps the Funk Brothers in the basement coming up with bass lines and harmonies like nobody's ever heard before. I'm 12 and I play basketball and I worship Dave Bing and Bob Lanier, black athletes who perform heroic feats night after night. I've got a drum set and I play along with Sly and the Family Stone and Coleman Hawkins. And like so many kids who grew up outside of cities like Chicago and Detroit and Philadelphia, there's only one thing I want to be when I grow up, and that's black. The injustice that I should have been born white. What real chance would I have now to fulfill my dreams, my real aspirations? I'm not kidding, that's how I thought. I think a lot of kids do think that, thought like that. But then I'm 16 years old. I'm driving back from Pontiac with my rural, back to my rural outpost north of Clarkston. I'm with a friend who's a whip-smart kid who uses all of his intelligence to no good ends. We have the windows down and Led Zeppelin going in about 180 decibels. We've also got several bagged ounces of marijuana in the back seat, which was the purpose of the trip to Pontiac. Some will keep, most will sell. That was the plan, anyway, until the flashing lights. The officer is polite. He asks us about a taillight, our plans for the evening, if we'd mind stepping out of the car, how we feel about jail, that sort of thing. <laughs> he finds the dope, of course. It's a windy night. He makes us distribute it over a nearby field. Bye-bye. He sees how scared we are. He makes us sweat for a while, and then tells us we're free to go. But before he disappears into the night, he looks at us for a few seconds, and he asks us matter-of-factly, boys, have you considered the possibility that you're idiots? Funny thing, officer, I was just kind of thinking the same thing. <laughs> as close as I am to Detroit, though, to Pontiac, it's still years before I come to understand. I expect I don't really understand it until I start teaching in the prison. How differently that scenario plays out if I'm a black kid, if I'm the black kid in Pontiac who sold us the dope in the first place. How unlikely it is I'm let off with the loss of my drugs and a warning if my skin's a different color. I'm 16, I don't have a clue how fortunate I am to be the white son of an affluent America. Fast forward, I'm 29, I have a Harvard degree, but it's from the Divinity School, the economy's terrible, and I'm down on my luck living in my brother's house in St. Louis. I see an ad from a community organizing group in Chicago. They're promising long hours for little pay, that sounds about right to me, so off I go. I take nothing with me, I get there, it turns out they weren't kidding. Not only that, but because I seem willing and more or less able, they put me in charge of a project they've got going right, right away. To bring me up to speed, they take me down to East St. Louis, where there's a similar project going on. Oh my God, have you been to East St. Louis? I wasn't completely naive. I'd been to India. I'd seen some perfectly horrible, terrible things. But this bombed out, forgotten, forsaken, hellhole place was right here in the middle of the United States of America. For Christ's sake, what's going on? Everybody's black, poor, desperate, and that mirrors much of what I'm seeing in the south side of Chicago as well. It's taking me a long time to disabuse myself of my romanticism, my myopia about being black in America. That reminds me of what someone in India said to me when I was there the first time, about all these tall, white, bearded, wealthy Western seekers looking for spiritual enlightenment among the poverty in India. You want to come here and look for truth? You want to come here and look like us? Fine. Give me the keys to your condo. I'm out of here. Except neither the poor Indians nor the poor residents of East St. Louis were going anywhere. I don't know. All of a sudden, at that moment, I felt like I'd been lied to. My whole life. But by whom? And about what? Equality? Opportunity? What America was? What it promised? Why didn't someone, anyone, tell me what was going on? I'm energized by that. A certain amount of righteous indignation, I suppose. So I go back to Chicago, back to my work there, with a zealot's enthusiasm. If we needed to burn Chicago down to make some changes, then by God, us good, guilty white folk would do that. We, I, would lead my downtrodden masses to the promised land. I warned you earlier that I've got a degree from a divinity school. And excuse the language, but we actually do talk like that. <laughs> I was working with middle-aged black women, for the most part, women who worked, with, uh, or worked as home health care aides and who are now organizing, with my help supposedly, to try to get somewhere close to minimum wage for the work they did, keeping other people alive. These women were truly the salt of the earth. 
doing the work nobody else wanted to do and doing it for less than anybody else would ever even consider. We had a big conference coming up. I was in charge of helping formulate the message, our successes to that point, our strategy going forward, um, even though the philosophy of the place was to empower the people of the rank and file never to be out front, so we didn't ever take credit for anything. We didn't do the speaking ourselves. For two or three weeks before this big gathering, I was working with a woman who would be speaking at the event, laying out the challenges and opportunities we as a fledgling movement had. I was at her apartment. Um, she came to the office, we talked, and man, did I write one hell of a speech. I mean, really, at the end of the day, all she had to do was get up there, read what I had written, and I can envision all these women rising as one, filing out the door, going down to City Hall, and finally ushering in an age of justice for all. Again, that's what I thought. My speech had solid research, it had impeccable logic, it had a well-placed quote or two, touch of emotion, righteous indignation. My high-priced education was on display, and this thing was really, it was so beautiful I could have cried, you know? Ah, come the day. We're in the Congress Hotel Ballroom, 250 strong. I'm taking notes and waiting for my turn to bask in the glory of my own words. Charlene gets up there, she looks at the pages in front of her. She looks at the audience. And she looks at me. She's nervous, I get it, but we'll be patient, no problem. She looks up again. She doesn't look too good. And then Helen, the organization's president, who's sitting in the first row, says, it's all good, babe. Just, just get up, read the paper. But she can't. She looks at me again, and this time there are tears in her eyes. And in front of me and the whole crowd, she says, Michael, I'm really sorry. I just never really did learn to read all that good. She's apologizing to me. Michael, I'm sorry. I just never really learned to read all that good. Shit. <laughs> now, here's the difference between me at that time in my life and a person of some actual wisdom and empathy. My first thought was, once what she had said had sunk in, was, all right, well, I'll get up and read it. I mean, why deprive the crowd of my speech, right? But Helen, sizing up the moment, went up, put her arm around this woman and said, honey, who cares? You just say it from your heart. You just tell, you, tell us what you want to tell us. Say what you want to say. Charlene dries her eyes. She gives me one last look, and she starts talking and talking. Oh, man. Martin Luther King Jr. had nothing on this woman that particular morning in Chicago. Really, she brought down the house. It was so much better than what I had written. It was so much closer to what moves people to actually act. I sat there with a copy of my crumpled up speech in my hands, feeling about two inches tall, and thought to myself, Michael, have you considered the possibility that you're an idiot? <laughs> Not once in three weeks had it occurred to me to ask if she was comfortable reading, if she could read, despite already months in the south side of Chicago. I knew illiteracy rates were high. So, moral or lesson number one in our three tales here. Um, could you please try framing your response in the form of a question? Can you be at all curious about anything besides yourself? Knowing thyself, stuff that I was weaned on. Of course it's important. You know, you want to try to get there if you can. But how about knowing something about other people? That would have been a little more useful, actually, in that circumstance. Can you, can I now, bring some spirit of inquiry to bear in my work, in my life? Does it occur to me even now? Does it occur to us? Ask the question first, rather than simply offering up our own opinions, our own point of view. A bit of an aside here, sometimes when I'm consulting, and I'm sorry for the, the word consulting. Everybody and their brother is a consultant, right? Um, if, if it's more palatable to you, think of me as a sort of weird philosophical advisor that a handful of companies in their infinite wisdom have decided to employ. <laughs> um, but I'm, if I'm working with somebody who's especially intelligent and ambitious, I'll insist that in certain points in our work, so they can only ask questions. They cannot intimate at the answers. They can't ask leading questions. They can't make declarative statements. For 10 minutes, 15 minutes in our conversation, it's all got to be questions. People find that remarkably difficult to do. I want to get them to, to habituate that to them, but it's very, very difficult. I suppose, looking back on all this sort of thing, it, it did lead, um, at least parts of it ultimately, to the Working Classics program here at Grand Valley. And you know, in the last 15 years, I suppose it's one of the reasons that Gleaves asked me to speak, I've gotten a fair bit of recognition and even some money in the form of grants. 
for the Working Classics program, uh, this, this idea where myself and Grand Valley students go out and we offer courses in the humanities and the liberal arts to places, to prisons and places like Job Corps where the people would not otherwise have access to this kind of, um, this kind of material. Um, and the heart of that for me was spending 14 years in a prison in Muskegon, teaching largely to black men. I wonder if I'd have done that without that year in Chicago, without Charlene, without Detroit, or without my parents' library and their willingness to subject their small children to the nightly news in the late 1960s. I doubt it. All right, tale number two. Carpentry convicts, crucible, consulting, and a question about crack cocaine. I, I may, maybe I'm tempted to say um, this has nothing to do w about me and crack cocaine. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I primed you with a marijuana story, so I just want to be careful about that. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't get worse. It's not a gateway drug, okay? Just, <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, look, I, I am honored to be here today, but it's also a bit odd for me, and I'll tell you why. This is ostensibly about the Hauenstein fellows, these uh, remarkably um, gifted Grand Valley students who are and will be leaders in the community and industry and in the professions, about what they might learn from speakers who, who come in who have figured out some reproducible or transfer, transferable principles or skills. The trajectory, sorry, trajectory, trajectory yeah, of my life, however, is so improbable that not only could you not reproduce it, I'm not at all sure why anyone would even try. So here's what I mean. If you came up to me and said, well, being a professor looks like fun, what do I, what do I have to do? Any reasonable person would say, go get a PhD. Right? It's the first step. No four-year accredited university will even begin to look at you anymore without a PhD. I don't have a PhD. I'm the last person in America who's ever going to get tenure without one. And you say, um, OK, well, that's not very helpful. Uh, so what else you got? What about this business consulting and advising thing? That sounds intriguing. How do you do that? And again, any reasonable person would say, well, get some background in business, take some business courses, take some courses in organizational psychology, do some marketing, do some managing, work your way into it. I had none of that, zero, when I was plucked from my philosophy office. You know, I'm, I was thinking about maybe not saying this, but um, going on this, the lines of qualifications here. I've been teaching ethics for the past 20 years, so there must be a joke in there somewhere about my qualifications to teach ethics as well. Um, but I think I'll skip the joke and just say, I do think we're drawn, one way or the other, to things that are especially difficult for us, things that are hard for us. One way or the other, they come back. All right, so then you may ask, well, look, since you don't seem to have any actual qualifications at all of any kind, how do you get to do all the stuff you get to do? You're forever flying around the world and talking to this person and working with these cool businesses and developing new programs and blah, blah, blah. You know, how does that happen? I like to think, by the way, that those people who ask me that question are actually interested in the answer rather than, really, no, really, who let you in? How, how did this happen? <laughs> Where is the door? <laughs> All right, let's take a quick, brief look at what is my, I don't know what to call it, my, my abstract expressionist approach to life. See if there are any lessons to be gleaned. <clears throat> the usual advice, and it's sound advice, would be, of course, there's a strategy that's linear, certain qualifications, hoops you have to jump through, no doubt about that, that's all good. Uh, but let's see if we want to stick with that or at least allow for the possibility that some intuition might play a role. So if you're following me, you know, good luck to you, but here you are. First thing you do is you drop out of your original graduate school program because it's only making you better educated, better educated, it's not making you wiser and you end up feeling hollow and kind of adrift. Then. You meet somebody like Louis Rosenberg, a master car carpenter, but more importantly, a masterly human being, who is generous and patient while you learn the craft, but is also insistent you work harder and better than you ever have before in your life. And you find yourself on roof rooftops overlooking Boston <laughs> in the middle of winter, unfortunately. Uh, you learn from carpentry that no amount of charm or BS can actually put the door in place or make the door work. You actually have to build it. You show up in the morning, there are blueprints, tools, materials, and space. Today, something that someone will live with and depend on for a long time, it's either in place and functioning, or it's not. It's easy to be a bad carpenter, I learned that. It's not all that hard to be a mediocre one, it's really difficult to be good. Um, Lewis would hate that I would romanticize in any way. Uh, 
carpentry, but part of what he taught me is, is just that. Just do the work. Do it well and stop making things either more or less than what they are. Next, here it gets just a touch mystical, if you bear with me. Feel an irresistible and irrepressible urge to apply to graduate school at Harvard, and only Harvard, and while you wait for their answer, go to India. The urge isn't really a still small voice as much of a kind of dawning or realization that won't go away. One of those, if you build it, they will come moments. I don't know where those moments come from or why exactly. When they have been as strong as they were in those, instance, in those instances when they've come, I've always said yes to them, or at least I've always tried to say yes to them. It's a sensibility, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an intuition. And it's when I've done so, said yes, that I am as far from being an idiot as I can get, even when what I'm doing makes absolutely no sense to anybody else in my life. So go. Apparently having a beard for all this stuff is very important. <laughs> so you, you might want to think about that as well. Go, wander around all over India for seven weeks on your own, alone with your thoughts. Well, alone with your thoughts and a billion Indians. <laughs> Trying to find words big enough to make sense of this kind of shift that you feel in your life now that you've been touched by the Ganges, by the Himalayas, by beggars and holy men, by con artists and shamans, by the overwhelming kindness and care of those who don't know you but somehow have seen right through to what you actually need. Come back. Go to Harvard because for some reason they let you in. Go to Chicago and then call your old mentor Stephen Rao and ask if you can teach philosophy at Grand Valley for a year before who knows what comes next after that. Start the Working Classics program while you're there. Begin teaching in prison. Meet Dan Engels. Get sent back to Nepal to start a foundation that builds school up in the mountains, schools up in the mountains. Learn something about lean manufacturing from what Dan does here at home. Start thinking about being in Grand Rapids forever. Then meet Jeff Cousy, which is when it gets really interesting. One could not make up Jeff Cousy. He's the owner of the Cousy Company here in town, a former professor with a law degree who majored in English. Cousy gets interested in my various adventures, what we're trying to accomplish in the prison by teaching the humanities, liberal arts, to folks who don't have access to them. And asked if I could do something similar with this company. You see how improbable this is. Are you taking notes? Are you writing it down? This is the path to follow? I say to Cousy, yes, why not? Most of the successful people I know say yes to stuff they don't know how to do. I'm just going to repeat that because I think it's really critical. Most of the successful people I know say yes to stuff they don't actually know how to do. The reason we say yes, I'm going to include myself in among the successful people even though I know I'm not as successful as most of the successful people I know. Even though we're remarkably underqualified, we say yes, is because we've had some series of crucible moments. Some ways in which we've tested ourselves, put ourselves in situations that were truly difficult for us when we're left to figure things out more or less on our own. We survived. Having survived, that gives us some basic confidence. We feel we can, in fact, figure it out, whatever it turns out to be. Um, plus, we all can read, so we just go to the bookstore and pick up a book on the subject, figure it out. I'm very glad, though, that one of my crucibles did not come in Vietnam. I was a couple of years too young for that. I wouldn't want to compare war with anything else that I've been through, though certain experiences on the south side of Chicago may have been similar. But for me, Chicago, carpentry, Harvard, extended meditation retreats, the prison teaching, and of course, romantic relationships seemed like crucible enough. Um, when you do say yes, though, to these rare and impossible opportunities when they come up, and you should always say yes, be prepared to work even harder than you've ever worked before. Don't get married until late in life because you will be wedded to the work. It'll be so fascinating and so interesting and they will call in the middle of the night and no one will understand why you actually do want to get up and go. Cousy definitely puts me to the test. We go back and forth with observations, references, suggestions, at first veiled but then kind of only thinly veiled but still more or less respectful jabs at one another's methods and then one day we're emailing about one of his people and I suggest a particular kind of development plan for this person that involves maybe more patience and more understanding than this person really needs. Uh, and Jeff writes back in an instant, and his message is simple. Are you on crack? No, Jeff, I'm not on crack. I assume it's his polite, gentle way, at least I'm guessing, of suggesting I may be an idiot, though, if not on crack. 
He makes me define and defend what I'm doing all the time. And I'm reading and writing again like I'm in graduate school, trying, one, to do good for his company, but two, I'm trying to shut the SOB up. Right? It doesn't work. You cannot shut him up. That turns out to be a very good thing, because like so many others I'm fortunate to work with, he's a terrific teacher. I'll just give you one, one story from, because I wasn't there when he did this, but I think it's worth hanging on to. I refer to it in my classes sometimes. He said one of his employees came up to him and said, I want to make more money. And Jeff said, no, you don't. And he said, no, no, really, I, I, I want to make, I need to make more money. He said, no, no, you don't. Said, what do you mean? He says, no. He said, anybody who really wanted to make more money would be going to school, would be proposing innovative and valuable proposals, would be talking to other people you need to talk to to develop those things. He said, there are a whole list of things that you would be doing if you really wanted to make more money. You clearly don't want to make more money. Seems like a useful <laughs> rule of thumb. By the way, I had a similar moment with Shelley Padnos. I, I work with, with them. I, I adore Shelley. I'm not saying that just because she's a chair of of the Board of Trustees at Grand Valley. I actually <laughs> truly do. Um, and they, they had hired me to do their, some um, issue with one of their, their executives. And I ended up doing a, a 360. So I talked to everybody that this person works with and talked to them and I write up this report. I'm really good at writing reports. I do that really well. Um, and I gave that to her and we're meeting. And at the top of the list, you know, Shelly, I know there's a, I think there's just some passive aggressive behavior there's some passive aggressive behavior that's really getting in the way. It's a problem. And Shelly looks down. She looks up. She looks at me. She says, I said, look, she said, half the company, is, the company is passive aggressive. <laughs> half the world is passive aggressive. Really? That's all you've got? Well, um, no, of course not. Of course, I've got a whole, that's just the first one in the whole long list of things I have to, to offer you in terms of the evaluation. Now, I'll tell you, when those moments happen, and they do happen, the hair, of course, does stand up on the back of my neck. Um, Bottom falls out of my stomach, right? I've, I've screwed up in some way. But I live for those moments. I live for those moments. Why? Because that's where the work is. That's what's exciting, right? That's where you actually learn something. Um, but you need your crucible moments. You need whatever your version of India, of the south side of Chicago, whatever those things are, you need those moments first so that you don't get debilitated or defensive when the criticism comes. You can stand up to it. You don't do like... Too, honestly, too many Grand Valley students that I see is that in the face of criticism, they kind of shrivel up and die, right? And you don't want to shrivel up. You want to know that if you've got something to offer, bam, you're going to come back. The criticism is not going to derail you. If it's accurate, fine. Listen to it, learn from it. If it's not, what's your argument? What are you going to say? All right, so moral number two. Not to be rude or anything, but do you actually know how to do anything? The people who matter to your future don't mean can you do finance, can you suture, can you program a computer, can you nail two boards together. What they mean is can you see and seize the opportunities that they'll offer? Can you add something of value that wasn't there before? That's what they mean. So again, with Kuzi, I'm, I'm trailing along behind Kuzi one day, and he's in his, his place, and he's frustrated with his employees because they're not taking advantage of the great opportunities that he's offering to them. He's, oh. He said, I would love to work for me. I can't believe people don't love. I would love, I want to work for me, right? That's what he's looking for. That's what everybody I know is, is looking for. John, I got to, I've gotten to know John Allen a little bit. He's the director of the Office of Great Lakes here in the uh, state of Michigan when he's not working uh, at Consumers. He's the environmental officer at Consumers, too. He said, I only ask one question when I hire. He said, what are you reading? And if there's no good answer, if they're saying they're not reading, or there's nothing that they're reading that looks like it's at all interesting to the kind of work we do, so the interview's over. I said, what are you reading? It's the only question I, I care about. Or have you developed what Jeff Padnos calls synthetic intelligence, the ability to pull from disparate places and fields and see what's not been seen before? If so, you will be invited to sit at the big girls' table someday. If not, you can still be a nice person and all, but that's probably about as far as it's going to go. All right, how to wrap this up or summarize it. Hubris, humility, and thanks. So the story would go like this. Whatever small measure of success I've had, whatever accomplishments, of course, I take all the credit for those. I did that, all those things, myself, through my hard work, intelligence, and charm. I've been accused of being arrogant and aloof along the way, 
but my wife will assure you that I'm not arrogant and aloof. What I am is elitist and exclusive. <laughs> I think that's different. What I hope I've shown just in the few little time that we've had is that our, my dependency on others is, is great. That this peculiarly American myth about self-sufficiency, pulling yourself up, may have served America well at some point, but it's just not true. It is true you have to be good. It has, it's also true people, other people have to let you be good. Some opportunity to be good. So we're not idiots here, but we all have the capacity for idiocy and to be idiotic. So you have to surround yourself with people who can help you be less prone to your idiocy, who take you seriously and thereby teach you how to take yourself seriously. If you're lucky, like I've been, that happens. You find that being taken seriously, surprisingly perhaps, leads to love. You didn't think I was going to say that. I didn't think I was going to write it. I had no idea I was going to write that until I sat down to write it. And I said, being taken seriously, that's what happened to me. Taken seriously, my capacity started to develop. That leads to success, money, fame. No, it led to love. That was a surprise. To love is eros, agape, philia, karuna, all of its forms. We don't talk about emotions or love as we ourselves experience them, either in the academy or in the workplace. We talk about them as either something to be studied or avoided. But both places are infused with love of one kind or another all the time. It doesn't help anyone that we pretend everyone is just some sort of disembodied brain. Teaching and consulting, as I see it, is a kind of midwifery. You are trying to give birth to ideas, capacities, the ability to flourish in somebody else. No midwife would be happy with a stillborn child, and no midwife would be happy being unable to talk about what it is they really do. I was with a friend of mine in California many years ago, long after I'd moved here. We were visiting a guy who had worked with me and, and Louis Rosenberg, the carpenter, in Boston. We were telling war stories about Louis having to fix things that we'd messed up uh, along the way. And the woman that I was with listened to these stories and said, wow, it sounds like you guys really, really like Louis a lot. And Brendan responded immediately and with great clarity, no, we didn't like Louis. We loved Louis. And that was right. That's exactly what it was. What kind of love? Probably doesn't matter. So bear with me in the remaining few minutes. Um, it may sound now a little like one of those Academy Award winning speeches where somebody says something semi clever for a second and then lists a long, you know, a long, reads a long list of names. Um, you're sort of hoping that the orchestra plays and the commercial comes on, and that sort of thing. But there's a point to this, so stick with me for a couple more minutes. I don't know what your life looks like without the people who took you seriously, who went out of their way in words. Um, or deeds to love you. Mine's probably unrecognizable. I can only imagine far, far worse. If I don't meet Lewis and Abby and Janice and Randy and Mary Beth and Leslie and, and Tim. Tim Schultz, by the way, is a brilliant guy, has his own IT business, and is a great bass player. You put those two together, therefore, you understand he's a man of very few words. Um, but I was moaning one day about you know, not making enough money for all the great things that I, I do, and he looked at me quietly and, and quite firmly, though, and said, Michael, he said, I don't know anybody richer than you said, who gets to do what you get to do? Said, said, who gets to have what you get to have? Said, who, who gets to know what you know? He said, and this was even before Mandy and the girls, so I mean, he shut me up, and that was good. Jeff, Shelley, Al, Doug, Nathan, JP, Tony, and Abigail, see, you can't stop. It just goes on, try it yourself. It becomes a long list pretty quickly. If it doesn't become a long list pretty quickly, you need to get out more. You need to find more people, or think harder. Peggy, Mandy, and then my parents, who are literate and artistic, have what the French call a folie à deux that works for them. Dan, Matthew, Chris, Katie, and the Dalai Lama, by the way. Yes, the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama and I had a moment in India. It's very nice, left an impression, so I'm going to include him as well. <laughs> and finally, this guy. Barry Castro, who died in 2005, left a hole in many lives when he passed. Barry was a mensch. Right? Yiddish word. The kind of guy you can entrust your life to and rest secure in the knowledge he would only enhance your well-being and never diminish it. Think about that. So I just wrote that about somebody. I don't know how many people I'd write that about. I would love to have somebody say that about me. It seems unlikely. You can entrust your life to them and rest secure in the knowledge he would only enhance your well-being never diminish it. 
He and his wonderful wife, Leslie, saved my life many times through the art of listening and feeding me dinner, too. Very is irreplaceable than one of his great gifts to me is to inspire me to be the kind of person who could, in fact, maybe someday replace him. Okay, last one. I wish I'd learned this earlier. Turns out emotions matter. Who knew? <laughs> we now have a lot of good cognitive science backing this up. Um, last slide. This, of course, from um, Shakespeare's Macbeth, one of the most famous uh, quotes. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. One of my favorite quotes for a very long time. Just before Macbeth goes out to meet Macduff and it's all over for him. Um, and I'm not sure what the appeal was to me for a long time, except maybe the fear that life was in fact a tale being told by an idiot. But it turns out that it is love and care that sustains, that creates, that allows us to say to Macbeth, sorry, you missed the cues. You chose the wrong that you would not do. You could not resist the power that destroys and that in the end your life, your life, is a tale told by an idiot. But ours are not, not ours. So, in closing, I just would say thank you for listening. I, I do wish all of you in your own way, of course, in your own way, all the adventures, all the difficulties, and all the love that I've had. And really, thanks very much for this invitation. We have plenty of time for questions, so as to help your fellow audience members out, just flag me down and I'll hand you the microphone. Yeah, I'm not so sure what you say to Shakespeare either. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think I need a microphone. I noticed from your bio that you uh, teach ethics. Could you give us or share us? Share with us your definition of it. <laughs> Somebody just asked me that the other day as well, too. I think it's, a, it's expanded. You know, it's, it's, it's anything but a rules-based definition. It's one that looks at the quality and character of relationships between people and, in, and environment and attempts to look at that in, in light of varying conceptions of what's not just good or bad, but what's better or, or worse. And then to do so in reference to everything we're learning from... Um, evolutionary sciences as well as religion and philosophy. How do you live a good life? How do you live a good life in community with other people in ways that, as, as I would say about Barry, that enhance other people's well-being rather than diminish it? That's, that's ethics. I'm really intrigued by your working classics program. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how the people you deal with have benefited from that, maybe some of the feedback you've received. Yeah, um, there's a book chapter coming out next year, would you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a large topic. Um, we, we started it in, uh, I, myself, a handful of students in uh, the late 90s. The, the impetus was, for me anyway, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with academia. Um, it's forever talking about stuff in classrooms makes me a little bit crazy. Uh, I like to, to be engaged as well in a, a larger context, larger conversation. Um, and we'd read a piece by a man named Earl Shores called Riches for the Poor. He said, look, whatever else the poor need, whatever else the marginalized need, the incarcerated need, <clears throat> they need access to the tools of reflection. That's, what does that mean? They need to have the same opportunity to think about their lives and the context of their lives and the development of their own cap capabilities that the rest of us take more or less for granted. Right? How are we going to do that? Well, his, his suggestion was something called the Clemente Course in the Humanities. So he got the very best professors from New York City, which is where he was based, and started at a homeless shelter and just started teaching the people who were interested, you know, logic, ethics, art, music, etc., poetry. Uh, that was very intriguing and inspiring to us. We didn't have the very best professors from New York City. Uh, we just had me. So <laughs> <laughs> and, but we had a handful of really, really excellent uh, Grand Valley students. And I asked them, I said, would you be intrigued? Would you want to do, try this and see what happens? And we started downtown, but within uh, a few months, 
uh, we had a, we had a young woman from Grand Valley who had a friend who was incarcerated at the Muskegon Correctional Facility. And I got a letter from him. I said, would you, we really need this stuff. Most of our programs have been gutted. Would you be willing to, to do this out here? And so we started at the Muskegon Correctional Facility in 1999, and we were there until uh, two years ago when uh, the state of Michigan shut it down. They just reopened it. So uh, in, in terms of everything it's meant, there are a couple of people here who've gone through it. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm more intrigued by what the students say. One of the things they've, they've told me, it has nothing to do with me, I think it has to do with the, the nature of the work, is that it becomes the most important thing that they do while they're in college. Not because I'm a great teacher, but because you've got to show up every week in front of prisoners or Job Corps students and really bring it. You've got to educate, entertain, inform yourself about who they are and figure out ways you know, to match the rhetoric with the reality in front of you. And the reality in front of you is often kind of chaos. Um, and a lot of them tell me, at, at the end of the day, this was the thing that, that pushed me the hardest. This was the thing that made me think the most about the value of my own education. I can go on for a long time about the working class experience. I'm sorry. <laughs> Does that help at all? You said that there was obviously a bit of improbability in the things that you were doing, and a lot of people didn't understand why you were doing them. But you said you sort of followed some sort of intuition or some sort of feeling of a calling. I imagine, too, at the same time, you must have experienced quite a bit of doubt in those situations. Like, you didn't know where you were going to end up. You didn't know how what you were doing was going to be meaningful in the sort of course of your life. Um, could you speak a little bit about that, too, about how you... Um, Here's, here's one of the ways that I always understood that, the story I told myself about that. This is great practice for something. This is great preparation for something. So the first half of my life felt like great. I had to do it because I, I, I truly did feel compelled to, to do these things. Um, I didn't always know why I was doing them, but there was a sense that this is going to mean something to somebody other than me someday. That's a huge leap of faith, right? And one of the reasons I ended the talk the way I did is because it's a, maybe it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. I'm not sure which one comes first. But I'll tell you a short, very short story about this guy, Dan Engels. So Grand Valley signs me to, as a visiting professor, one-year contract back in 1994 or whenever it was. Um, no security, no money, no, no, no nothing, really, right? But I've got a friend who teaches at U of M, and he says, oh, you know, you've got interest in, in in India and Nepal, I said, I've got a friend, you, you, two, you two should meet. Uh, so I've been to India, I know something about the East and Eastern philosophy, blah, blah, blah. I go, finally, it takes us two weeks, I finally go, I sit down with this guy, Dan. We're having a beer, just talking about life in Nepal. And he looks at me, 45 minutes into the conversation, he looks at me, he says, how would you like to go to, ne to Nepal in two weeks on behalf of my foundation? I said, great, one beer, and this guy's completely schnockered, he has no idea what he's saying. <laughs> All right. So he can't hold his, his liquor. Um, two weeks later, I'm on a plane to Nepal. Okay? And I get off in Kathmandu, and there's a Sherpa there waiting for me. And we take a helicopter, and we're up in the mountains. There is no foundation. It's just Dan's desire, because this particular Gurkha, actually is what he was, um, I was acted as a bodyguard for him. He says, you know, I want to do something. I don't want to know. The test for me was, was I going to come back? Was I going to be the kind of guy who saw the opportunity came back and said, this is what you could do in Nepal, right? So all that stuff early on, I mean, just one example, there are a bunch of them like that, one example where I was doing it for partly selfish reasons and partly reasons I couldn't articulate, and it, all of a sudden there are just connections that open up. I don't know why Kuzi's interested, I mean, he's here, he can speak for himself. I don't know why he's so interested in the prison work, why he thought the humanities might work. With, with his people, other than his commitment to reading, you know, and, and the transformative power of that. It's strange what happens. <laughs> you can't care about money. If you can't care about, if you care about money, you don't live this life. It can't happen. Uh, 
was shocked when the money came. What are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now I'm reading a few things, but um, one of the ones I'm, I'm struggling with through right now is The Moral Molecule by um, a guy named Peter Zak. He's an economist turned uh, neuroscientist, and I'm, I'm just really intrigued by all this stuff right now. So his whole thing is that uh, the moral molecule is this oxytocin, and um, it's the bonding and trust. Uh, it's the reproductive neurotransmitter for all of us, and all of ethics, all of morality can be traced back from an evolutionary point of view to the evolution of this particular molecule. So it's a huge challenge in, in terms of how philosophers understand morality and this kind of thing. And I just got back on, uh, uh, over the weekend <coughs> from a, what's called a neuroethics conference. So we've got some top neuroscientists in the world who have now gotten very interested in this question of neuroethics, the, the way we make moral decisions, the way they evolve uh, in the brain. <coughs> and so I'm sitting in this room with all these, these guys from Harvard and Cornell and Oxford, and they're pretty dazzling. Um, but the ones who are the best, and the ones who I'm really in intrigued by, are the ones who are making the analogies between neuroscience and art, literature, philosophy, the ones who are really well, well read and, and well um, versed. And it's funny, at the end of the conference, the psychologist gets up and says, well, you guys might be corroborating stuff, but we in psychology have known this stuff for 60 years. I mean, there's a kind of duh factor here. He said, yeah, but look, now we can image it. So who knows where that's going, but I'm reading a lot in that stuff uh, right now. And then, and then my wife, um, for my, my birthday, which was recent, just gave me, gave me a, cop, a, a biography of um, Jim Henson. And in our family, we are, we are huge fans of the Muppets, no matter what age we are. Uh, and so I'm reading um, about Jim Henson. <laughs> Could you... Uh, talk about what role religion or spirituality played for you and your experience. And then second, two-part question, <laughs> what do you think... Uh, I have another thought, wait. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that's necessary to have a reference to an objective uh, truth as religion provides or not? Do I think it's important to have Necessary. That? Necessary. Necessary. Um, I, again, I am under the influence at the moment of a lot of the evolutionary sciences. Uh, but I had a professor at Harvard who was, I think, ahead of this curve in, in some way because he had us do a thought experiment. He was a rock-solid member of the United Church of Christ. For him, God was the what, spirit, the being, the creative force behind all things. But he said, look, he said, so... He essentially did for us a modern version of the, the Jews escape from, from Egypt. So you find yourself in the wilderness, and you've got to create a community, right? And so what do you do? You're, you've got people of various talents and various physical skills. You've got men and women and children. And you know, how to create, a, what's going to happen? What's the first thing you need to do to, to be a surviving community? And people offer what are, you know, obviously like obvious solutions. Well, first you've got to elect a leader, right? And then you've got to have an army or police force. And then you've got all these kind of Hobbesian notions about what you have to do to make sure that you get a community that coheres. And he had a very naturalistic interpretation of something like the Ten Commandments. He said, he said what if you got together and what if you just reflected for a moment on the requisites of community, what we already know as people, based on your experience as slaves or, or, or just people now, what's required for people to come together, even in a room like this? and not be fearful of being robbed, killed, slandered in some way. He said, there are natural inhibitions. It's a naturalist or intuitionist approach, evolutionary approach now from my point of view, in which we have been designed, and I'm happy to leave, the, when I teach this in class, I actually leave the, the question of God off the table. I said, if God is behind all this for you, I'm perfectly fine with that. God's not it's a perfectly random series of events, and evolution has selected for certain cooperative traits that we have codified as religious, you know, in various cultures and various ways over thousands of years. Said so either one of those, it seems to me the important question to me is, 
are you a halfway decent human being? Do you recognize those inhibitions? And do you, in fact, um, live up to them? If you ascribe those to Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism, I'm very interested in, in how and why and what you can teach me about that. If you ascribe those to no particular tradition, um, but you're somebody I'd want to live next door to anyway, I don't care. You uh, shared a few examples of how um, following your intuition led you to some, some sort of success and helped you along the path. Could you share an example of what happens, for instance, when you follow an intuition and maybe your parachute doesn't open and you have some failure, or, or how to recognize that? Um, how, do you, how do you recognize it? Uh, you knock on your brother's door, <laughs> even with your fancy degree, and say, you know, <clears throat> the world has conspired against me. Poor, poor me, can I eat your food? Uh, and sleep in your basement for a couple of months while I try to get back on my feet. Um, so I thought I was doing all the right things, you know. Um, but uh, I'm sure as my wife would say, I have no reason to be arrogant at, at all about anything, or at least sort of exclusive as given you know, some, of <laughs> some of the failures. As, as you know, Matthew knows, um, I think one of the, one of the failures, but I... It's, it's, it's paradoxical, but I, I like talking about it this way. One of the failures is the Working Classics program um, because we have such grand designs for it. It was going to transform not only the people's lives whom we taught, but it was going to be transformative for education in some way too. Right? We were going to show univers this university and other universities what, what was to be gained by a more proactive approach with the community, by putting students in situations that were crucible moments for them, more difficult. They had to rely more on themselves, not on professors or, or peers. Um, at least at the time that the CWC was at its peak, that didn't really happen. Right? And so the failures of that um, were brought home to me, even though I think it's the right thing to do. That's why I added that line about, um, you know, it gives me an out, which is, even when nobody understands, nobody else understands what I'm doing. I press on. <laughs> That's, I'm incredibly fortunate to have my brother and others there to pick me up when it doesn't work out. We have time for one more question. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I think it's very important to think about luck as well and the luck of birth, the luck of having people to fall back on the luck to be in a position to follow you in, your intuition, uh, which is, is a, a great gift that you have. I, I did say that at the end. If I, I, I'm happy to. I, you're absolutely right. right? So I said, it, you know, if you get lucky like I, I've been, uh, it could easily have gone a different way. Right? And so what spurs it off for me, I mean, the reason I started with those images from, from Detroit is, and, and my experiences in St. Louis and Chicago is, you know, the chances of me getting lucky are a little greater. I, I appreciate that. You know. Though it's, the, it's, you know, there's been a flip side to that. So the Kellogg Foundation at one point dumped a whole bunch of money on us um, to expand this program and, and to hire some professors. And I showed up at a couple places in Grand Rapids. I said, look, the Kellogg Foundation wants us to take the Working Classics program and sp apply it specifically for black men in the community so that they can become better leaders. A third of black men are on parole in prison. I mean, everybody knows the statistics, right? It's huge risk. Um, and they looked at me in ways that make perfect sense to me. And they said, you're white. Go away. <laughs> right? Uh, we weren't originally going to do the, the, the leadership program in the, in the prison. We were going to try to do it in the community. Um, and one of the things that I, I had never thought about until we started teaching prison, and it was, it was an entirely African-American community, is that um, half the guys had never had any contact with white people outside of the court system. So it was, it was, a, it was an anthropological experiment from both sides. It wasn't just us. I'm not saying they were lucky to, to meet us. I think we were luckier than they were, but I appreciate the point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again very much for, for listening. I appreciate it. Give me another hand. Keeping in tradition, we'd like to express our gratitude to you, Michael, for with a Howen Science Center swag bag. Thank you very much.
I uh, firmly believe that our leadership ability is dependent upon our personal character. And part of personal character is really knowing thyself. And uh, I think those three tales were extremely powerful uh, into, into that process of knowing ourselves. Uh, we have a distinguished guest with us today. We have the uh, founder of the Cook Leadership Academy, the reason why we are all here, Brian Flanagan. So if, uh, Brian, you could stand up and be recognized. Second row, four chairs over. <laughs> we really appreciate your groundbreaking work. We know that we are all benefiting very much. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Michael, again. And uh, have, a, have a great week.